Alright guys, on today's adventure we're going to be checking out some amazing aquatic animals off the coast of Jupiter, Florida. Like these sandbar sharks right here and these goliath groupers. As summer comes to a close, it's time for the goliath grouper aggregation. And this is a really amazing time of year when all these giant behemoth fish come together in one spot to breed. The goliaths will congregate among wrecks and other substrate along the bottom. And here you can see just dozens of them hanging out along this shipwreck right here. These romantic gatherings of giant fish can bring goliaths from up to 350 miles away to come together to spawn here. Now you'll notice the goliaths are different colors. Some are dark, some are more tan, some are more white, and they will change these colors to communicate with one another and let each other know how they're feeling. One of the first things you notice as a diver approaching these goliaths, other than their gigantic size, is the sound. You'll hear them making their characteristic booming sound back and forth to communicate with one another. Unfortunately, the underwater camera doesn't really pick that up so well, but it is really, really cool in person and you can almost feel it. And when they're all together like this, it almost sounds like a war zone down there as they're all just going off. During this scuba dive, we drifted across several different wrecks, as you can see right here, along with my dive partners, shark biologist Michelle Edwards, and then my friend Philippe D'Andrade, who works for National Geographic. Shipwrecks like this might seem like human garbage on the bottom of the ocean, but it actually acts as an artificial reef and is incredibly beneficial to the surrounding wildlife. In fact, these ships were sunk here on purpose to help out the wildlife. Here we have another group of goliath groupers and these ones are hanging out along this large sunken pillar and they're actually using it as a buffer against the current. The current was ripping this day so you'll see how they just kind of hang out right behind that to try to block the water. Now you'll see those flashes going off. That's from my underwater camera setup. So I have a large DSLR rig with a Canon 90D in there with strobes firing to illuminate for photography. And then I also have my GoPro Hero 9 mounted on top of the dome and that's what's shooting the video you're watching right now. So that's why you'll see those kind of flashes going off intermittently. The flashes do not harm the fish in any way and it doesn't seem to bother them and they just kind of uh, slowly, lazily scoot out of our way as we're drifting by in the current. Here I decided to flip the camera around for a minute to give you guys a little bit of selfie style and you can see the size of the groupers next to me. And then here Philippe is lining up a few shots of the Goliaths as well. He's getting some really good photos of them right there. Now with a name like Goliath Grouper, we of course have to talk about the size of these things. Some records of Goliath Groupers are up to 8 feet long and over a thousand pounds. Those crazy records are definitely disputed, but in the more recent ones there have been Goliaths that have been caught over 600 pounds and having ones on the reef at the 400 pound size is not that uncommon to see. Now this goliath I came up on is actually missing his left eye. Try to look closely right there and you'll notice there's no eyeball there. And you can see a little bit of scarring around it but really not that much. So I actually have no idea what happened to this poor goliath right here. Maybe it's a parasite, something like that because there doesn't seem to be that much trauma around it. But the goliath does seem to be surviving perfectly fine and looks very healthy. Now then, right after that, we encountered this Goliath whose eye was like exploded out. Take a look at that, really strange looking. And so again, no idea what's happening here, but uh, this one's blind in that eye as well. And the whole eyeball is just kind of protruding and looks like it blew up. 
This is the MG-111 shipwreck, and it's actually an old Mississippi barge sunken down here. And overall, it's not that interesting looking of a wreck, but it is very important for the Goliath grouper aggregation. And it's also home to a lot of other fish, as you can see right here, hanging out, living on and amongst the wreck itself. A little further off, I spot another piece of wreckage and decide to uh, cruise on over and see what's hanging out over there. Usually the Goliaths like to hang out on these little pieces and there you go. You can see just the top lobes of the fins behind this structure right there. And as I come swimming around the side, you get a better look at this Goliath that seems to be resting on the bottom in the sand there, trying to get out of the current a little bit and have a little bit of a nap maybe. And here it is, just kind of slowly, lazily swimming off away. We then drifted over to a set of pillars that are standing up on the bottom and this is where a lot of the goliaths were hanging out and this location proved to be the best spot for being able to get up close and personal with these goliaths. They were spread out all over the place in this area, some of them on the pillars, some of them just hanging out across the sand as you can see these ones are doing right here. Now seeing this many goliaths together can give you the idea that wow there's so many of these fish around but in reality they're few and far between and you don't often see very many of them except during the aggregation time of year like this. Otherwise you might see one or two on a wreck if any at all and in fact the goliath groupers are actually listed as endangered. In fact, worldwide, they're listed as critically endangered by the IUCN, and throughout most areas, you won't see them at all. But here in South Florida, their population is doing very well, and they've rebounded thanks to this protection. Unfortunately, some seem to think they're doing a little too well, and fishermen have been pushing really hard to be able to kill the Goliath groupers once again, even though their populations were dropped 90% due to overfishing, and throughout most of the world, they still are severely depleted. But again, people do want to fish and kill these poor things, which to me is very upsetting. I love to see them alive, and they're a huge draw for the scuba diving tourism community here in Florida. A few years ago, FWC was holding hearings discussing whether or not they would allow the take of the Goliath grouper, and I actually went to these meetings and I publicly spoke out about this situation and advocated for the conservation of these incredibly charismatic fish. Thankfully, the protection stayed in place, but again, now in 2021, they're talking about trying to fish for them again. Goliaths have a slow reproductive cycle with females having to be eight years old before they can breed and then you can't even eat the meat anyways. Due to the amount of pollutants in the environment, their flesh harbors mercury and they're not safe to eat. So the only reason anybody wants to kill one of these fish is ego only, not something I would support. You'll also hear a lot of people say, well, now there's too many of them and we need to control the population because these big fish are eating all of the native fish that we want to catch, and that's just simply not true. There have been numerous studies showing that the diet of the Goliath grouper is mainly composed of crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, and then also small fish that live on the reef, but not game fish. Now a hooked fish that is in distress is a beacon for any predator to come and eat, whether it's a shark or a grouper, but if you're fishing like that, you need to get your fish in faster. We can't blame the native inhabitants. There also are not too many goliath groupers out here. Their numbers have only slightly rebounded, and this is where we come into the topic of shifting baselines. Shifting baselines is an incredibly important topic for people to understand when it comes to conservation. And what this means is people will make a decision based on their baseline data. And because humans have such a short and relatively insignificant lifespan, if you grew up and you had Goliath groupers and there were not very many of them back in the 80s because they were almost extinct, and then now you're seeing, let's say, a 10 or 20% increase in the amount of fish from a 90% deficit, then you're gonna think, wow, there's way more fish than there were when I was a kid, it's time to hunt them. But in reality, the actual natural deficit went from a 90% decrease to now maybe we have a 60 or 70% decrease from what the population should have been without humans intervening in the first place. 
Now those are just numbers I'm using as an example. I don't know what the actual numbers are in this topic since I'm not a Goliath Grouper researcher, but this topic of shifting baselines is really important to understand in any conservation sense now that we have protections in place for many animals or populations rebound and then people use that as an excuse to want to kill them more. The moral of the story being that we need to leave these kind of decisions up to scientists and hard data that has been accumulated across several decades. Now back to just experiencing the magic that it is to swim with these groupers. Look how close I am to this one. Look how cool this is. This particular group allowed me to come in very close and I felt like I was one of the Goliaths. I was literally right in there with them hanging out inches away from some of these several hundred pound Goliaths. This one Goliath in particular just did not seem to care at all. He was hanging out right next to me, even bumped into me a few times. Didn't seem to mind anything at all, just kind of doing his thing. Now this is how they are sometimes during the aggregation though, because they're so focused on each other and their courtship and breeding that they'll allow you to get much closer than they would outside of this time of year. Normally these guys would never let you anywhere near this close, but right now they will because they're more focused on each other. Although what's funny is right now, they're not actually doing anything. They're just kind of hanging out together, but they're not actually spawning. And in fact, their actual spawning is still a mystery. We don't really know exactly what they do. We know they aggregate like this, we know they hang out together, and we know that they spawn. But nobody's ever been able to actually document the act of when they're actually doing it, and what they do, and what the behavior is. Now as large as they are, you might be thinking, well, how old are these Goliaths? Now that depends on who you ask. Some people believe they can live over 50, even up to 100 years old, but as far as verified by science, at least they have a record of 37 years old, but again, 50 is still within reason. Looking at that huge jaw right there, you might also be thinking, well, are they dangerous to people? Will a giant fish like this try to eat somebody? And the answer is no. They're not interested in us. They don't attack people or anything like that. And in fact, they're usually very shy. And usually if they are approached, what they'll do is they'll make that loud boom sound to try to scare somebody away, and then they'll try to flee. In fact, when you look at the mouth, you'll notice there are not any teeth. They don't really have teeth. They just have kind of a bristly lip right there that they use to try to grab onto their prey, but they don't have any teeth. So their method for hunting is more of like rapidly opening the mouth, sucking in something like a lobster or crab, and then swallowing it down whole. Now, I had an amazing time with the Goliaths, but let's go see some other really cool sea creatures, these sandbar sharks right here. So I was able to go out diving two days in a row, one day scuba diving with the Goliaths, and then the next day doing a free dive snorkel with these sandbar sharks. During this session, we had about eight sandbar sharks show up together. Now, you can tell these are sandbar sharks because of the size of the fins. That's really the dead giveaway when you're looking at them, is their fins look like they're a bit too big for their body. They're really kind of cute and goofy looking, and they're also a little bit on the smaller side as far as the sharks go. Now, they're also closely related to a bull shark, and you can kind of see that in the coloration and the face a little bit, but they don't have that same tenacity that bull sharks are famous for. I've dove with sandbar sharks for many years, and oftentimes they're very, very shy. As you can see those two right there, they just spooked each other, and then that one just went zipping off into the depths to run away. But they are often very shy. But every once in a while, you get some of them like this individual right here. They kept on coming in very close to me and checking me out nice and close. Sandbar sharks are definitely one of my favorite species of sharks to see just because, again, they have those big goofy fins and uh, they're kind of on the smaller side, so they're kind of cute, they're kind of goofy looking, and I just really enjoy spending time with them. Now as we wrap this video up, I want to say a big thank you to my buddy Roger at Salty Divers for taking us out, and then also thank you to Cressy for supplying all the dive gear you see me using today. If you've enjoyed the video guys, make sure you leave a comment, like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next adventure.